We come now to our second study presentation here at the British Columbian Camp 1984. This is the Sabbath service at uh, 10 o'clock on the 25th of August 1984. <clears throat> now, we, we now come to the main theme of our camp time spent together. Last time was simply a little update, an introduction to the week, an update on what we'd learned in regard to the question of child salvation and um, I don't plan to say any more that during this week unless of course questions arise that necessitates further examination of that. Every year of course as we're well aware the Lord gives to us a new message, new light that we haven't seen before. This, week, this year might be just a little different in that uh, I have uh, a request which I considered prayerfully and saw great wisdom in a request to present the history of this particular movement. Now, this I think is quite important and I'm glad to accede to that request. I feel quite directed to do so because most of the people now in the movement were not with us during the days of um, the pioneering of this great message. And we, those of us who were, of course, have been through some very great experiences which um, have very deeply confirmed our faith. The statement where Sister White talks about this in respect to 1844 and she says that those who went through that time obviously of course the first hand knowledge both by sight and experience of what it was all about. They, they knew the spirit of the times first hand whereas later generations have to depend upon uh, the reports or witnesses of those who have come after. <clears throat> now I don't propose to give a simple um, rehearsal of the history of the movement I want to um, pick up the Laodicean message and also the great prophecy which spring from that message that relate to the birth of this movement and then I want to thereafter to give a fairly um, adequate but concise account of what's taken place in the years gone by to demonstrate how exactly prophecy has been fulfilled and to help us to realize that uh, history is being made that we're not simply a little group of people who are enjoying camp meetings that history is being made the final movement is being formed the final people are being prepared to go forth under God's direction and power to finish the work we look back on past history such as 1844 the great Protestant Reformation the history of the Jews and we see history being made by those people as time went by we recognize the significance of the work that those people did how important it was in the unfolding of the scroll and the preparation for the finishing of God's work. And we need to go away from this camp meeting realizing that today history is being made. The history of God's church, the most important history in the entire world of the present time. And while the nations of this earth are shaping up for their part or their role in the final conflict, God's people are also being shaped up for their part in that same great battle. I'm very impressed by the fact, of course, that as you folk are too, that the present Pope of Rome is, a, is, a, is, a, is superior in talent, in charisma, in abilities from any Pope in our living memory. In fact, right back for many centuries. He is now standing Pope, and at the present time, not that I'm praising him, I don't get that idea, um, but I do recognize uh, quality when we see it and we have to recognize the fact that our foe is a very very powerful and wily person and here person, the present time is going forth to the entire world conquering and to conquer and this is the exact antitype of Nebuchadnezzar's brilliant conquest of the world in his day that just as Nebuchadnezzar was an outstanding Babylonian in fact the outstanding Babylonian so I say that the present Pope is the outstanding Pope you make a visit to this country, I believe, next month, and uh, preparations are under full sway to give him a very, very wonderful welcome, and he'll get it too when he comes. Now, just as uh, in the at the very time when Nebuchadnezzar was going forth conquering the entire world, God was preparing for the ministry of Jeremiah four young men. Their names were Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, to give them their Babylonian names, or Daniel was, Daniel was the original Hebrew name, of course. He became known as Belteshazzar. And um, Nebuchadnezzar was totally unaware of what God was doing. And if he'd been told that four young men would enter his kingdom unarmed, unsupported by great uh, armies, 
and these young men would defeat him at every battle that they, in which they met, he would have laughed the whole idea to scorn. And if the present Pope of Rome was to be informed that a little company of less than a thousand people around the world are being prepared to defeat him, he'd laugh too, wouldn't he? <laughs> he'd think that was a huge joke, and we can't blame him. But when he's finished conquering the world and has the end to world at his feet, he'll suddenly find this little band of people filled with the awesome power of the Holy Spirit will, will prove him more than a match for um, the plans and schemes that the Papal Church is putting together at the present time for total world dominion. And later in the week we'll talk, I think we'll be talking about um, what will bring about this, this final crisis in the world of the present time. So with this, with this introductory um, sketch over, let's turn now to Revelation the third chapter and we'll read together the um, message to the Laodicean church and uh, we'll learn some new things about this church I think during the next day or so which will prove to be of great value to us and which will help to put into perspective quite a number of prophecies and events which stem from those particular prophecies. We start with verse 14 and um, we have this message then written as follows and unto the angel the church of the Laodiceans write these things saith the Amen the faithful and true witness the beginning of the creation of God I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot I wish you or would you were cold or hot so then because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot I will spew you out of my mouth because you say I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and white raiment that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear and anoint, and anoint your eyes with eyes so that you may see as many as I love I rebuke and chasten be zealous therefore and repent behold I stand at the door and knock if any man hear my voice and open the door I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me to him, who, to him that overcometh will I grant the sip of me in my throne even as I also overcame and set them in my father and his throne he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches the messages to the churches always include a revelation of Jesus Christ and this in this case he's the Amen the faithful and true witness to begin the creation of God I made the point in the revelation series last year the year before the year before I believe it was that uh, the presentation of Christ to each particular church is exactly what that church needs exactly and each presentation is different the only two similar ones are between Sardis and Ephesus they are very similar in both cases Christ is presented as the one walking up and down the seven golden candlesticks but to the others the presentation is different from church to church and when we studied them in the Revelation series we found how exactly appropriate each presentation was to the people of that particular time and we'll be giving some very definite consideration to the presentation of Jesus Christ as the faithful and true witness, the Amen, the beginning of the creation of God, later on in our series. The next part, of course, is the actual message delivered to the church, followed by the admonitions at the end. Uh, in the case of Laodicea, there are no commendations, only condemnations. Whereas God could find something good to say to all the other churches, I think, except perhaps the Sardis Church, even the Thyatiran Church, there were some good comments made for them, but not for Laodicea. It's a church which suffers only condemnation and is called upon to repent of her backslidings. Now, as we're concerned principally with history today, um, in respect to the final application of the Laodicean message, we want to understand exactly what the Laodicean message is, what it is designed to accomplish and what it will accomplish in the hearts and lives of those who receive it. Now, <clears throat> let me turn first of all now to the Great Controversy, page 457, where a, a rather revealing statement is made by the pen of inspiration in regard to what would have been if certain other things had taken place. So I turn to page 457 in the book Great Controversy and uh, we, we then read this particular statement. Uh, I'm going to go across to page 458 as well, 457 and 458. 
The history of ancient Israel is a striking illustration of the past experience of the Adventist body. Now we appreciate the fact, I'm sure, that uh, parallels do have a very important place in the unrolling of the scroll. That history does repeat itself, that uh, the same issues are fought out over and over again, and tragically, of course, so far the church has come out on the wrong side of great issues and have gone into oblivion. Let me remind you of the statement on page 343 in the Great Controversy. Don't lose your place on page 457 if you have the book. Page 343 four, reads as follows. The work of God in the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformation of religious movements. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past and the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our own time. So note um, then these, these points in this paragraph. The work of God in the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every <coughs> great reformation of religious movements. So that's why it makes it plain that the pattern of the past will be repeated and that uh, therefore the important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past and the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our own time. Does this indicate then that a person who is a very thorough student of past church history who understands God's dealing with, with past movements and the responses of those movements to God's appeals is such a student at a very definite advantage in forming his own character development? And the answer is most decidedly yes. The better we understand the history of the past, the less chance there is we'll repeat it. Because as we understand what took place and learn the lessons from what took place, we are less apt to make the same mistakes as were made by those in the past. And I'm certainly personally thankful that um, my understanding of past history saved me from making some very serious blunders in, um, in this work over the past few years. Now let's um, come back then to uh, the Great Controversy to follow it through. Page 457 now. The history of ancient Israel is a striking illustration of the past experience of the Adventist body. God led his people in the Advent movement even as he led the children of Israel from Egypt. In the great disappointment their faith was tested as that of the Hebrews of the Red Sea. And now comes the main sentence, the rest is context. Had they still trusted in the, to the guiding hand that had been with them in their past experience, they would have seen the salvation of God if all who had laboured unitedly in the work in 1844 had received the third angel's message and proclaimed it in the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. A flood of light would have been shed upon the world. Years ago, the inhabitants of the earth would have been warned the closing work completed and Christ would have come for the redemption of his people. Now let's just look at this on the, uh, the board this morning. <clears throat> now the statement says that if, if all who had laboured unitedly in the work in 1844, so let's go back then to 1844 here. Now prior to that time, during the period of the midnight cry from August to October 1844 there were 50,000 people who came out of the churches and they accepted of course the first and second angels messages not the third the third began to shine on the morning after the great disappointment now here then is the third angel here and the statement says that if all that is if there's 50,000 had maintained their faith in the leadership of God, had received the third angel's message which corrected the mistake made, of course, on October 22, then very, very quickly the work would have been finished and Christ would have come to redeem his people. Years ago, she says, in 1911, in this great controversy edition, the work, the work would have been finished and Christ would have returned. But as we know, of course, a, a shattering blow was struck at the movement and of that 50,000, less than a hundred according to some estimates and perhaps just a few more according to other estimates completely lost their faith went out into the world and that setback was so serious that the work of God has still not been completed 
Now, <clears throat> it is no fault of God that the, um, the, the, that the Great Disappointment took place. Now, most of you know that have read this article by Ray Briner in the January issue of the Messenger called God's Unvarying Consistency. And I'd like to just review some of the main points in this article this morning because I want you to see that the, the setback which did take place in 1844 should never have been and God certainly never planned it. Although certain statements do give one the impression that God um, had planned that particular um, uh, setback in order to test these people and purify the movement. But once again, as in the character of God, we need to revise our interpretation of that particular statement. So let's now um, take uh, a look at the principles involved in this particular problem to recognize that it was not God's fault. In fact, God did all he possibly could do to prevent the trouble from surfacing at that point of time and to save tremendous shaking which caused the message to to break down and the later sin condition to emerge right <clears throat> now we understand from James chapter 1 and verse 12 that God doesn't tempt anybody under any circumstances the temptation which comes to us is permitted by him only because the human agent fails to fully cooperate with the Lord or because Satan is permitted to to work his will against us and um, the statement here from Christ I'll be listening, I'm just trying to find for the moment which says that God does not hide his um, his intentions from anybody yeah, that's, yes it's Christ I'll be listening, page 105 we don't have the book so I'll read it out of this publication it says God does not conceal his truth from men by their own course of action they make it obscure to themselves Christ I'll be listening, page 105 now we're well aware of the fact that um, Sister White draws a close parallel between the disappointment experienced by the apostles in the days of Jesus Christ and the disappointment experienced by the Millerites in 1844. And these two disappointments are paralleled in the book Great Controversy. Now let's turn in our Bibles to, to um, Matthew chapter 16, first of all. Matthew chapter 16 to note the situation when Christ asked that searching question of his disciples as to who men said that he was. We start with verse 13, Matthew chapter 16. Now, we might notice of course that by this point of time uh, Christ had been working for probably well over a year I would say that at least half his three and a half years had gone by the time he asked this particular question. And apparently before this point of time, Christ had not attempted to unveil to his disciples the real nature of his work and the fact that he was going to suffer persecution and be crucified and raised again the third day. Now before Jesus Christ began to give those revelations to his disciples, he asked a searching question recorded in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13 and onwards. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? And they said, Some say that you are John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremias or one of the prophets. Now, the disciples had been observing the evaluation uh, given to Jesus Christ by the various religious leaders and so forth of that time and uh, it was generally recognized by the population that Christ was an extraordinary person um, to be equated with a great prophet such as Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets but still just the man I'm rather interested to notice John the Baptist now being dead of course having been beheaded in the, in the Roman dungeon that uh, in, even in the minds of the people back at that time John the Baptist was now he was dead was uh, rated as being on a par with Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the other prophets now while men recognized Jesus Christ to be an extraordinary man they did not see God in the man they saw only a man blessed of God inspired by his spirit but not not by any means a, a God upon this earth so Christ then pursued the question he said to them but 
but whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjana, for flesh and blood has not revealed unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also to you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall, shall, be, you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now the Saviour recognised that at this point of time the apostles had made a significant advance in their grasp of spiritual things. He recognised they'd come a long way even though they were still imprisoned with the, in the wrong ideas in regard to his kingdom. But he felt they'd come sufficiently far as to be able to at least uh, begin to hear the real truth about his mission. And so read in verse 21, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how they must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the, of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And note the words, And from that time forth began Jesus to show them these things. So this is the beginning of this revelation, obviously it was done before this point of time. Not that they didn't need it before this point of time, but they were un unfit, uh, incapable of receiving the testimony at all. And it doesn't look very promising here either, because the response of those men to the Saviour's announcement was very negative. Let's look at verse 22 for instance. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from you, Lord, this shall not be unto you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offence to me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So that um, even now, even though they could see that Christ was God in a man, they were still not able to accept the real nature of Christ's mission upon this earth and still look for a kingdom of glory and power. Now, as you read on to the succeeding chapters, you find that uh, now and again the text surfaces indicating that, uh, that Christ took every opportunity now to impress upon their minds the real truth in regard to his coming sacrifice upon Calvary's cross. Um, now, let's move on to chapter 26, for instance, the first few verses of chapter 26, where Christ, in a rather emphatic way, um, told them what uh, his future was going to be and informed them that they already knew what the outcome of his trip to Jerusalem was going to be. Genesis chapter 20, I mean Matthew chapter 26 verse 1 and 2 And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples you know that after two days is the feast of the Passover and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. In two days. He said you know it. Now how, how could Christ say they knew it? because he told them again and again and again. Now when the, when the arrest of Jesus Christ took place, when he went to that terrible trial before the Jews, before Pilate, before Herod and back to Pilate again, when he was dragged out to Golgotha and crucified, all these men should have been anticipated by those disciples. Nothing should have caught them by surprise. But when they did happen, it was as if they had not been told at all. Was it not? It was as if. Now, we have now two pictures. We have the picture of what was and the picture of what might have been. And those pictures were very, very well worth comparing. What was, was a crushing disappointment, total desertion on the part of those men of their master, a complete inability to understand what was going on, bewilderment, confusion, perplexity, all so serious that they almost completely lost their faith forever. And how they survived, of course, is a miracle of uh, divine grace and power. And um, the end result was that the Church of God at that time appeared to have disappeared from the face of the earth. The leader was dead and buried in his grave. The apostles were scattered and unsure of themselves. And there was no positive witness being given at all in regard to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And that's the picture of what was. Let's look now at the picture of what might have been. If those men had prayerfully accepted and, and uh, 
by spiritual power understood what Christ had to say to them in regard to, the, to his death and resurrection then they, then, then, then they would, would have approached that um, significant weekend that Passover weekend knowing precisely what was going to take place they would have um, seen Christ arrested no surprise to them they knew it was coming anyway they have seen him dragged to the courts and there would have been no surprise to meet them taken out to Calvary and they're crucified and there would be no surprise to them either they would, have, they would simply have said well it's all happened according to plan hasn't it and there'd be no disappointment no confusion, no perplexity no uncertainty and they would calmly have gathered around the sepulchre waiting on, on Sunday morning for the resurrection which would have been a very wonderful event to them so there are the two pictures what, um, what was and what might have been and which of those two pictures do you suppose God desired to be the answer is self-evident is it not God desired them to approach the crucifix intelligently in full knowledge of what was going to take place and to move right along with God's plan to wait the resurrection morning and to, and to triumph in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that's what God desired now why didn't God get what he wanted because of the blindness that rested upon their eyes because of their stubborn unbelief, because of their tenacious cling to what they wanted. You know, of course, that in this world most people are slaves to their emotions and they accept only that which is emotionally tasteful to them. What is emotionally distasteful, they'll reject because, because, because of that. It doesn't matter how logical the arguments may be, how convincing the truth presented, if they find themselves in a situation where that which is offered to them is, is emotionally distasteful, where it threatens their particular interests and desires they reject it only because of its emotional implications not because it's truth or error that, 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 that has no bearing in the case whatsoever now we, we have ample proof then that God left no stone unturned to prepare those disciples to avoid the great disappointment of the crucifixion and the burial of their saviour Jesus Christ and they entertained no hope even though Christ had repeatedly said in three days I will raise again did they believe it? not at all they just didn't believe it at all now the point is this that if the God of heaven if God's dealings with men are ever the same if that's what God did back there with those disciples then would he not do the same in the 1844 movement too? wouldn't he? remember his dealings with men are ever the same therefore we have to expect to find that in 1844 God did expend a great deal of effort and time to educate the, the Adventist mind not the seventh day just the Adventist mind to understand what was going to take place in 1844 to be fully prepared for it and thus not suffer the crushing disappointment which, which thinned the ranks so drastically and as we shall see shortly was a mighty factor in inducing the Laodicean condition in the Seventh, in the seventh Adventist Church and I might make the observation that once the Laodicean condition gripped the Adventist folk they have never, repeat, never recovered from it since never the condition only become worse and worse down to the present time now let's look at uh, a little bit of the 1844 history to um, see what God did do in his efforts to um, save the Advent Church from the disaster which overtook it <coughs> in the Great Disappointment. We have before us some extracts from various history books in regard to the experience of William Foy and uh, Foss, Hayes and Foss, who followed him uh, down toward the end of the Great Disappointment period. Now this first statement comes from the Christian experience of William E. Foy together with the two visions he received in 1845 and if you want them of course you can find them published in the, in the January 1984 Messenger magazine. I'll read this first statement first of all in regard to Foy. William E. Foy, a member of the Free Will Baptist Church who was preparing for the ministry was given two visions in Boston in 1842 one on January 18 and the other on February 4 in the first of these revelations Foy viewed the glorious reward of the faithful and the punishment of the sinners not being instructed to relate to us what was shown him he told no one of his vision but he had no peace of mind in the second revelation he witnessed the multitudes of earth arraign before heaven's bar of judgment a mighty angel with silver trumpet in hand about to descend to earth by three steps 
the books of record in heaven, the coming of Christ and the reward of the faithful. He was bidden, you must reveal those things which you have seen and also warn your fellow creatures to flee from the wrath to come. Another extract this time from um, an interview by D. Robertson with Mrs. E. G. White, 1912. It's in White Publications, uh, 231. Two days after this revelation, he was requested by the pastor of the Bloomfield Street Church in Boston to relate the visions. Although he was a fluent speaker, he reluctantly complied, fearing that the general prejudice against visions and the fact that he was a mulatto would make his work difficult. The large congregation assembled was spellbound and with his initial encouragement before he travelled three months delivering his message to crowded houses. Then to secure means to support his family he left public work for a time but finding no rest day nor night he took it up again. Alan Harmon, when but a girl, heard him speak at Beethoven Hall in Portland, Maine. That's the end of that statement. The next one comes from the Great Second Advent Movement, pages 146 and 7. Near the time of the expe expectation 1844, according to J.N. Loughborough, Foy was given a third vision in which were presented three steps, or three platforms, which he, could not, which he could not understand in the light of his belief in the imminent coming of Christ and he ceased public work. It so happened that a short time after this, Foy was present at a meeting in which Ellen Harmon related her first visions. She did not know that he was present until he interrupted with a shout and exclaimed that it was just what he had seen. Foy did not live long after this. He died very shortly after that point of time. Now, obviously then, through Foy, a very talented young man, and God... Uh, normally likes to call talented and skillful people. Moses, Paul and Daniel were, were very talented people. But not always, of course. When talented folk refuse, he then turns to less talented people, as in the case of the fishermen that Christ called to be his followers back in his day. Now, it becomes very obvious that God called this man, William Foyim, and gave him visions and a message to convey to the Advent people, which, if they had been received and understood, would have saved the church from the great disappointment. No question about it. Now, we have a situation, of course, where Foy uh, laid down the work God gave to him. He made two mistakes. The first one was that um, in order to support his family, he gave a public work and went back and got a job again, whereas he should have said, very simply, that if the, if the work be of God, if God's called me to preach this message, it's God's responsibility then to feed my family, which is what it was. There was a lack of faith in his part to, to, to take on that part of the work himself again. But worse still, when he couldn't understand what he was preaching or, or what he was being shown, he desisted from public work and gave it up altogether, leaving the church without the further warnings which God desired to bring to them. Now we cannot today say with certainty that the church would have believed. Probably they wouldn't have. In which case, of course, the discipline would still have come but would not have been for his fault. If he has faithfully given the truth God gave to him, then any rejection and consequent disappointment would have been the fault of the church, not of him. We have, for instance, the fact that Jesus Christ very skillfully and ably told his disciples what the real outcome of his mission was going to be, very skillfully and ably, and no one could have done it better than he, but so deep and dark was their prejudice that they could not see what he was telling them, and the consequence was it was, his, it was as if Christ had said nothing at all. But in view of the fact that the disappointment did come, that Foy had the messages designed to prevent the disappointment, the responsibility now rests upon him for backing out of his task when he ought to have been doing that, that very important work. There are two situations we must very, very carefully avoid. One is to do a work that God hasn't given to us, and the other is, and the other is not to do a work that he has given to us. Both are very fatal mistakes. Lucifer up in heaven, of course, tried to do a work God had not given him. What a fatal mistake he made. And Foy refused to do the work God had given him. What a fatal mistake he made. So the all-important thing is to be where God puts us in no other place but that. We pass on now to Hazen Foss, and uh, this statement comes from a letter written by Sister White in 1890, and in which she says, Near the time of the expected advent in the fall of 44, there was also given to Hazen Foss a young Adventist of talent, a revelation of the experience of the Advent people. 
Shortly after the passing of the time, he was bidden to relate the vision to others, but this he was disinclined to do. He was warned of God as to the consequence of failing to relate to others what had been revealed to him, and was told that if he refused, the light would be given to someone else. But he felt very keenly the disappointment of 1844, and said that he had been deceived. After a severe mental conflict, he decided he would not relate the visions. Then, very strange feelings came over him, and a voice said, You have grieved away the Spirit of the Lord. And uh, as we shall read in just a moment, he became um, un uninterested thereafter in spiritual things. Now I'll read further, this, this time from the same letter. Horrified at his stubbornness and rebellion, he told the Lord that he would relate the vision, but when he attempted to do so before a company of believers, he could not call it to mind. In vain were his attempts to call up the scenes as they had been shown to him, and then in deep despair he exclaimed, It is gone from me, I can say nothing, and the Spirit of the Lord has left me. Eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses described it as the most terrible meeting they were ever in. Early in 1845, Foss overheard Ellen Harmon relate her first vision to the company of believers at Portland, Maine. He recognised her account to be a description of what was shown to him. Upon meeting her the next morning, he recounted his experience, of, of which she had not before known, and encouraged her to faithfully perform her work, stating, I believe the visions are taken from me and given to you. Do not refuse to obey God, for it will be at the peril of your soul. I am a lost man. You are chosen of God. Be faithful in doing your work, and the crown I might have had, you will have. On comparing dates, they discovered that it was not until after he had been told the visions were taken from him that Ellen Harmon was given her first revelation. Although Hayes and Foss lived till 1893, he never again manifested interest in, <coughs> in matters religious. Now you may say, well that seems awfully severe on God's part to take away his eternal life just because he wouldn't do the simple work of relating visions. Surely God could respect the man's liberty to refuse the uh, responsibility and God does respect that. Now the simple fact is this of course that when Hazen Foss and William Foy refused to do the work God gave them to do they were rejecting the principle of the gospel which says that I will serve where I am called no matter what the cost may be to myself. Now when Hazen Foss counted the cost more important than the mission then what was he doing? rejecting the gospel. And if you reject the gospel, what do you reject? Eternal life. You, you reject salvation. So God did not take salvation away from him. God did not, in a spat of temper, say, well, if you won't serve me, I won't reward you either. God didn't do that. Hazen Foss placed himself outside the circle of the gospel. He rejected life, and he reaped the terrible consequences, of course, in the loss of his eternal life. And this will happen to everyone, of course, who refuses to take up the call that God gives him to do. It will also happen to those who put themselves in a place where God has, not, God has not commissioned them in both cases. Now this account of the effort on God's part to bring the light to the, a prophet prior to 1844, immediately after 1844, demonstrates that just as God worked to save the disciples from the great disappointment, he likewise worked to save the Advent people from that same experience in their time. And it's no fault of God for one moment that he was not successful in, in this respect. <clears throat> because if the word had been heeded as it should have been, then the great discipline would never have taken place. And in turn, they never would have been allowed to see in church because the work would soon have been finished and they'd have all gone home to be in heaven. Let me just make the point in closing this study hour that the, that the latest see in church uh, is not the last church. It's, it's, it's a... Um, intrusion, something which should never have been there. Now last year, you remember for instance, we demonstrated from the Spirit of Prophecy that the promises made to the Philadelphians were not fulfilled back in 1844. The main promise is that God would make those who say they are Christians, Jews, as the word is used here, but who are in fact the synagogue of Satan, that God would make them to come and bow before the saints' feet and to know that God loved his people. That's never happened yet. It will not happen until the sixth plague has fallen, the seventh plague is about to be poured out. Then the wicked, their eyes opened to see the real nature of God's love and God's law, 
and to recognize God's character in God's children will bow down before them and worship them and acknowledge that they are God's true children. Mm. Then will be fulfilled the promise to the Philadelphian church. Now in as much as the promise of the Philadelphian church will be fulfilled to Philadelphia during the Philadelphian period, then very obviously the one in four thousand will be the Philadelphians and Jacob's twelve will be the period of the Philadelphian church because that's when this promise will be fulfilled. Now we'll be looking very closely at the Laodicean message and uh, its presentation of the Sardis church and its, its consequent presentation of the Laodicean church and we'll see that properly received that message will bring forth a people who are not lukewarm, who are not destitute of the gold, the white raiment and the eye cell but have all the qualifications to be God's instruments for the finishing of his work and when that time comes of course the work will very very quickly and speedily be finished so in 1844 God sent the Gospels to the Sardis Church that began to bring out Philadelphians and then because of this failure on the part of the Advent folk to recognize the real nature of the, of the event to take place in 1844 the great disappointment came the church was shattered there were very very few survivors and because of what they had passed through they then became almost certainties to enter into the later scene experience which has been a delay, an intrusion, a retardation, a, a, a marking of time and worse than that of course an apostasy back into the ways of the world again. And I said a few moments ago once that later scene condition came the church had never ever recovered from it from that day to this and never will. It is now left of course for God to bring out a new peer which he's doing at the, present, at the present point of time. So let's leave it there for the study period and we'll take a break now for 15 minutes and then come back to continue our consideration of the latest in messages and its effects upon the history of the Advent people.